Hi everyone, I'm Julia. I'm a homeschool mom of four and in this video I'm going to talk to you about how to use narration in your homeschool. Narration is telling something back that you have heard, read, or seen in your own words. If you think about it, many people narrate all the time. When you share with a friend or family member about a great book you just read or a movie you saw, you are narrating. In a homeschool setting, students are narrating back things that they have had read to them or have read themselves. Um, and you could actually have a student narrate back something they've seen like in a documentary or a play, for example. But when homeschoolers talk about narrating, they're almost always talking about books. In the younger years, they are just telling you back what they have heard orally or verbally, but as they get older, narrations can also be written. Narration is often associated with the Charlotte Mason method of homeschooling, as in her method, she uses narration for pretty much every subject. It really, it really centers around reading living books and then narrating them back. I believe it's also used to some extent in classical education, which makes sense because Charlotte Mason was inspired by classical education as well. Narration is often used in a way similar to comprehension questions or quizzes in that the children have to pay attention to the story or the text that they were supposed to read, or they won't be able to narrate back effectively. However, narration also has benefits beyond what you would think of as general, like really simple comprehension questions or a quiz that you would get at the end of a book. Most of those times, those questions are one word, phrase, or very short answers. You're just asking for facts um, to make sure that they, you know, read it. What is the name of this character? What is the location? Things like that. Uh, they're asking for general facts, general plot points maybe, just to check that there was reading comprehension, basically, or listening comprehension if it's being read aloud. Narration goes further. It really makes the children process the information. So they have to take it in and then they have to process it and really understand what the text is saying. And they have to be able to tell it back and they have to really, you're working on them putting it in order as well. So there's a lot more that is happening in there. And some people claim that this actually makes the information go into longer term storage than the simple comprehension questions that might just be a short term information that they're holding on to. It is a skill that needs to be practiced and built upon and then it can move into writing composition as the child grows older and matures. Now that we've talked a little bit about what narration is and why you might want to use narration in your homeschool, I'm going to share a bit about how I start my children with narration and then how we currently use it in our homeschool. Again, I have four children. They are 11, 8, 4, and 2. So I'm currently only using narration with the 11 and 8 year olds. The 4 and 2 are too young. I generally start the process of narration around 5 or 6 years old. I also want to mention that I am inspired by Charlotte Mason, but I am not even close to a purist. I kind of, I'm more eclectic, um, taking from some different things, although I do love a lot of the parts of the Charlotte Mason method. I believe that what I do with narration may not be exactly what she prescribed or what modern, more pure Charlotte Mason homeschoolers do. So this is how I do it. I have read this book multiple times, in fact. It is No and Tell, The Art of Narration by Karen Glass, and I do recommend it. I will have it linked below, and I may refer to this, so I wanted to show you that now. So getting started, I start with my children when they are around five or six, and this really depends on their reading and reading comprehension. I had one that was a little farther along with pretty much everything to do with language than the other. So they started a little bit sooner than the other, but five or six feel out when you feel like your child is developmentally ready. When we started, we started with very short stories. I mean, very short. So we started with this Aesop's Fables book and this has the stories or the, you know, the fables are one page. That's kind of a, <laughs> they all have an illustration as well. It's nice to have illustrations for the kids but keep it super, super short, okay? And you you may be able to use like a religious text like the Bible, Torah, or Quran if the stories are short enough. Uh, I also have this like kindness, treasury of Buddhist wisdom book that has some stories that are short enough, but definitely not all. So again, just keep it super short. And we did not do all of these. I kind of picked and chose what based on what I thought would be easiest as well as maybe what my child would be interested in. And then I would just read them the story 
and ask them to tell me what happened. And their narrations at first will probably be really short. They will probably miss parts. They may just repeat the last line of the story and that's okay. Be patient. One thing I recommend is that you narrate yourself. So tell your child, I'm going to narrate this before you start reading, read it and then narrate it to them and like demonstrate what you would like them to do. We want them to be working towards telling all the important parts of the story in order from, you know, beginning, middle to end. And you may find, as I did, that narration's actually harder than it seems. So keep that in mind. And that's one of the reasons we start really short. But you go ahead and narrate for your child, demonstrate what you're looking for. And then I did that several times, not in a row, but kind of interspersed with their narrating to just kind of remind them and keep demonstrating what I was looking for. And you can move on to shorter stories but I wouldn't even do a full story then at once. So let's say you're gonna do like this Brambley Hedge. I love, I love Brambley Hedge, it's just very cozy. Um, and let's say you were doing, let's see here, this Brambley Hedge spring story. Um, the story is several pages long. I don't, I don't know, I didn't count, but I would probably just do this one page, read this page, and then go ahead and ask them what happened on this page, thank them for their narration, and then move on to the next page. Look at these pictures. Sorry. Okay. Getting distracted by pretty pictures, but you know, pretty pictures are nice when you're doing school or anything else. Um, so that's how I would do that. And if they seem like they're getting tired, you don't even have to have them narrate the whole story. Again, it is a lot of work. It's a lot of brain work. So please keep that in mind. Be gentle with your child and yourself. It is important to start with stories. So you could in fact narrate facts from an encyclopedia, but it's not going to get you that same kind of learning to tell the narrative, hence narration, that you would with a story. And so that's really what we're practicing as we build up this skill. You know, going forward, they should be able to hear or read things and recite facts back, but that's not really as important in this age when we can, you know, look things up all the time. We want them to be able to work towards being able to write and do that beginning, middle of an end arc. So um, it is important that you do this with stories. And I also, I think most people find that more enjoyable. There may be some exceptions, but I think for the most people, stories are more fun. At times, while we're building the skill of narration, I may guide the children, especially if I feel like they're missing something really important or they're starting maybe later in the story than they want them to be, I may just kind of direct them <laughs> into something, give them a hint or direct them to start a little bit sooner. Um, and and from my understanding, that's not really recommended, especially if you're interrupting them. You don't really want to interrupt their train of thought. Um, but I found that I've, I found it to be useful in kind of getting them to um, teaching them what I want in a narration and how to get the full story in. I just found that it helps to communicate with them what I'm looking for. So we continued narrating with literature for a while and then we also added in history and things like biographies and stories that we're doing for um, artist and composer as well as geography. Even sometimes science when it's like about a person or kind of more in the story format. We have always also had a family read aloud that does not require narration. So for many years we would actually do this before bed as, a, as an entire family my husband would read aloud. We've fallen away from that a little bit and now the read aloud is more so just me and the older two and then I read like picture books and stuff to the younger two um, but just because of uh, of chaos with the younger two a little bit but I'm hoping we can get back to that family evening read aloud soon and that was just really like just for fun enjoyment it's later in the day our brains may be tired but it's like a really good family bonding time over books so um, I did not, I've never required narration at that time. And because of that now, we generally don't narrate literature so much anymore, with the exception of my eldest, who I do assign books to her, and she has to narrate back to me what she has read, um, mainly just to demonstrate that she has read what I've required her to read. Um, so it's more just a check on that than to practice narration. We do narrate history as well as still like the biographies and stories for artists, composers, geography and such. So I do have both my children 11 and 8 still doing oral narrations and we're not doing like the whole book at once. I will pause in the book and ask them to tell me what happened. I also do often have them tell their father at dinner what they've learned that day and that in itself is, is another form of narration. 
Many homeschoolers have more than one child who may be of narration age and you may be doing these group subjects. I know that I do. So I wanted to share with you about how I handle that situation. Um, so firstly, when we're starting to learn narration, you know, with the Aesop's Fable or other very short story, that is one on one. That is not a group situation. But when we're doing history, we do it as a group. So here's what I do. Let's say we're reading through Who Was Napoleon, which we did just read for history. And I will read um, not an entire chapter, but maybe I'll read a couple pages. And then um, when feel like when I get to a good stopping point, and then I will ask one, I'll usually call out one particular child and say, tell me what happened. And just in this section, I, I might even tell me what just happened or tell me what happened in the section I just read, something like that. I'll try to be specific. And uh, occasionally I'll be like, okay, who wants to get started and tell me what happened? And sometimes after they're done narrating, I will ask the other child if they have anything they want to add. Now, it's important how you kind of, the tone of voice you use with that. This is not to like critique or correct the previous person's narration. I just want to make sure that both of my children, or all if you have more than two, are listening to the material and also are listening to each other's narrations. Um, and it's just simply a, do you have anything you want to add to that? And usually they say no, and I'm like, cool, let's move on. And we move on to the next section. And I don't necessarily alternate because I want them to be on their toes. I don't want them to be like, oh, they just narrated, and so I don't, like, I'll listen to this section, but I just narrated, so I won't listen as closely to the next, if, if that makes any sense. I want them to think that they could be called to narrate at any moment and so have to focus on the material. But I do try to make sure I am asking both of them throughout. And if I am asking more of one than the other, I try to ask the older, more advanced one more than the younger one. I also know that my children have specific interests. And so if we're reading something and a section talks about something that is one of their particular interests, I will probably ask that one to narrate because it's just more fun when it's a topic that you're more excited about. After your student has been narrating verbally for several years, you can move towards written narrations. Now, No and Tell here has a little chart um, here that talks about like the different grade levels and moving forward in written and then like composition, if you will. Um, so what she says is grades one through three is building oral fluency. Four, five, and six, you continue oral narration, but you build writing fluency. Seven, eight, nine, continue oral narration, achieve writing fluency, and develop composition skills. And then 10, 11, 12, you're still working on all those, and then you learn formal writing. So um, that's what her scope and sequence of narration is. I'm still on the early end of that with a third grader and a fifth grader. I do have my fifth grader do written narrations, and we do this a little bit differently than oral narrations in that we're not stopping in the middle and doing a written narration. I will generally have her do one either about an entire story. So if I've assigned her especially a book to read, I might have her write a narration on the entire book or like basically like a book report, but usually it's more open ended. Or more often, I will ask her to write a narration about a person that we learned about. Sometimes I give her a choice of like two to three people from the place or time period that we have learned about. And she is currently rotating between doing that with handwriting and typing because she has practiced both those things and we kind of are trying to keep them both, uh, both in practice and rotation. My eight-year-old is in third grade. Um, he will be nine in a couple of months actually. And we are just starting the process of moving towards written narration. So what I do with him is I still have him verbally narrate to me. So when I'm asking my fifth grader to do a written narration, I will also ask him to do the same. I'll give him the same narration or option of narrations and uh, have him tell it to me verbally. I will write it down and then I have him copy my writing. So it is his words and his narration, but we're isolating the difficulties. So we've been talking about this building the skill of narration and you can kind of get the idea that it's, it's not easy. It's something you have to practice. It's really a skill you're building. On the other side, there's the whole skill of handwriting, spelling, grammar and sentence structure. I mean, those are multiple skills that are hard in and of themselves. So we are practicing those separately, but I don't want to throw all of that together with the building of the skill of narration all at once. That is a lot. Um, so we work up to that by having him copy his narrations at first. Now, when we do get to the point where they are doing writing their own narrations as far just just 
just go. I'm not helping out. <laughs> um, I, I will, first of all, I do offer help with spelling. We talk about if there's any tricky spelling words as we go and I'll write them down for them. Um, and they can, you know, ask questions as they go on grammar or whatever as well. Um, but just know when they're starting that their narrations will be shorter. They won't be as good as their verbal narrations at that point, because again, it is adding that layers, many layers, it feels like of difficulty. So be prepared for that. Again, be patient. What we are doing in our homeschool is practicing. They're not going to have these skills immediately. We're building them up. And at this point in their writing, I don't really correct the narrations. So again, with my eldest, who's in fifth grade, um, I will look over her narration. I want to make sure she's actually doing what I assigned her to do. <laughs> I'm not fixing really any spelling or grammar or sentence structure mistakes at this point. That is something that um, she does separate spelling words. So I will go through her narration. I will use words that she has misspelled in her spelling words over the next several weeks and I will just know that there's areas to go over as far as grammar or sentence structure or whatever um, later or if there's maybe a letter that I'm struggling to read with handwriting or something again we'll go over that separately and later. I often think of Julie Bogart sharing about this and that is she, she talked about how a child might spend all this time writing something for a parent and be so proud of themselves and excited about it and they bring it to you and like half the words are spelled wrong and it's a mess and like there's no periods or whatever and you're you go and you're like oh this is great let me like fix your spelling and add the periods and like do all this stuff and then suddenly what they were so excited about they're just like disheartened and maybe even more than disheartened like totally discouraged and upset and um maybe even gutted because they were so excited to show this to you and you just like pointed out all the flaws um so i try not to do that <laughs> we're still at the stage in writing where we're building this confidence and fluency and so that is for so i did actually pull out a couple of their narrations that they have written to just kind of give you an idea this is a typed one i'm just going to see if i can cover her name here <laughs> show you anyway um this is on Marie Antoinette so she typed it she liked she used the colored thing and it did get cut off a little bit at the beginning so I might reprint it, it I just had her use Google Docs I'm gonna go ahead and read this through quickly for you so this is on Marie Antoinette Marie Antoinette was born in Austria her parents were the Emperor and Empress of Austria when she was 15 years old she went to France to be married to the future King Louis the 16th of France four years later they were married uh, Four years later, they were married, the king died, and Marie Antoinette became queen. After a while, she gave birth to a baby girl. Finally, a little while later, she gave birth to a boy. A little bit after that, she gave birth to another boy. Just a bit after the birth of her second son, there was a scandal known as the Diamond Necklace Affair. A blacksmith came and asked for a uh, for... A little bit's cut off at the beginning, so I need to... Uh, oh, for payment for a diamond necklace he had made. It turned out that the lady had bought a fake note that looked like it was the queen's handwriting to a cardinal to get the necklace for her. Then her husband took the necklace to London to sell the diamonds. The cardinal was tried and found innocent. France was in a financial crisis, so the king was forced to call the Estates General for the first time in a hundred years. A lot of stuff happened, but we're talking about Marie Antoinette, so we're going to skip a bit. There was a shortage of food. One summer day, a group of angry mothers marched to the palace to demand food. The king tried to calm them, but could not. The royal family was forced to move to Paris. Eventually, they decided to escape. They were disguised, and they headed into a carriage and set off. They had made it pretty far when the king was recognized. A messenger was sent to the next town, and when they got there, they were apprehended and brought back to Paris. It was decided that they should be kept in a prison called the Temple. It was eventually decided that the king would be beheaded. Months after the king, the, months after the death of the king, Marie Antoinette was led to the guillotine and beheaded. The end. And then she made a note on the bottom that says, "To be fair, this is very oversimplified." <laughs> So that's hers, and, and she did do um, a drawing to go along with it. Um, and then for my third grader, this is one that, I can actually pull it out because I haven't taped it in here yet. Um, this is one that he, uh, he did out loud and I typed for him. Um, and this is on Maximilien Robespierre. So obviously these are from our French Revolution study. Um, and this is, Robespierre was born in Arras, France. His mother was a peasant and his father was a lawyer. His mother got pregnant and then they had to get married. He went to college in Paris and when he was at college, out of 500 other students, he was chosen to give a speech to the newly crowned Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. He gave the speech and the royal family left without acknowledging him. 
After college, Robespierre Pierre became a lawyer. He represented common people who needed help. He was fighting for justice. Eventually, he became a judge, then he became a member of the National Assembly. He was a member of the Jacobin Club and was against the king. He argued that there should be no trial for the king because he was a traitor of the revolution. In the National Assembly, the Jacobins were known as the Mountain because they sat at the top and they were powerful. He helped form and become he became head of the Committee of Public Safety. It was basically a dictatorship. <laughs> they killed lots of people who thought they were enemies of the Re who they thought were enemies of the revolution. He put that in quotation marks. He became more and more paranoid and killed lots of people. He ended up killing Danton, his friend and colleague of the revolution. The people began to get mad because they still didn't have food and they were killing lots of people. And he ended up being killed by way of guillotine. <laughs> he really, he really wanted to put that by way of guillotine. Um, yeah. So that is his eight year old third grade narration on Maximilian Robespierre. Most of the time I keep narration really simple, but sometimes you can be more creative with it, either with the prompts you're asking or even the format that you're doing the narration. So uh, No and Tell here has a list on suggested prompts for creative narrations. Um, I'm just gonna, I'll just highlight a few of them. So um, imagine you are interviewing one of the characters or historical figures. What questions would you ask? How would they answer? Write your imaginary interview. Write a journalist's newspaper account of what happened in your reading. Narrate in the style of Shakespeare, Jane Austen, etc. Uh, write a dialogue or perhaps a full scene for a play or screenplay based on the reading. Pretend you are one of the characters. Write a letter about what happened to you or what you saw. Uh, imagine you are a neighbor or servant and write account of what you saw or heard. What if you were one of the animals? Write your narration from the animal's point of view. I should remember that one for my um, fifth grader would really like that. Uh, write and draw your narration as a cartoon, write as your narration as a poem or a song. So there are lots and lots of different ideas. Um, I, I believe, uh, I don't know if she still has her YouTube channel, but, um, and I'm forgetting her name, but the, the person who made Build Your Library, um, she had a YouTube channel. I think it was ARG Homeschooling, so you can see it was there, and she had um, some fun narration ideas. If I can find it, I'll link it below. As I said, for the most part, I have kept it pretty simple with the oral and written narration, but we have done uh, quite a bit of drawing, and I find that really useful with younger children. Um, you know, that it can be a lot for them when they're young, and it's just fun to like, ask them to draw something that they saw, or a person, or just draw something from your reading. You can have them as they get older also do it the cartoon style, where like there's different scenes, so they're still telling the story in the form of drawing, um, or they could act out or dance something. Um, so there's lots of fun ways you can do that. One, one thing we have done is last year I had them do, so this would have been fourth and second grade, we did uh, Europe for geography and I had them each choose a country to learn a little bit more about. And then they did little brochures for that country. So they did Italy and Iceland and I helped them find the pictures and format it. I helped my, um, second grader at the time more than the fourth grader where they both got help on formatting with me so they ha and I did ask them for like some specific information and then gave them some leeway on others so um let's see she has like I, I wanted to, them to know like what the language was and the the capital and all that stuff so she did a little bit on food and then on animals because you know food and Italian food's awesome and she just also loves animals and then she did a little bit on art to see because it's Italy um, and on the government as well. And I did ask them to put the flag in there. So my son in second grade did Iceland and he did the flag. Um, and he just did some fun facts and he did a lot on places to visit because they were really cool. <laughs> we were basically planning our trip there for when he's older, we want to go. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then what to eat, because also what what to eat is important. Uh, so yeah, so this was this was a fun form of narration that we've done, and we might do something similar or slightly different this year as we're doing the Americas. That is narration and how I use it in my homeschool with my children. So that was a lot of information. If you liked this video, please make sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe and comment if you have questions. Please ask them in the comment box below. I do try to answer what I can. And until next time, I hope you all are healthy and happy and well. Bye, friends.